we're in New Jersey on our way to see the man Andy Warhol called his favourite photographer. He's not a big name art or fashion photographer, nor a war reporter, but a paparazzo. And not just any paparazzo, for Ron Galella, now 83, is regarded as the king of this highly controversial profession. This is the Liz Taylor file, see, look. All this is Elizabeth Taylor, look. All Elizabeth Taylor, <laughs> color, all black and white. And this is the Jackie file. These are the Kennedys, Kennedys here. But this is only part of it. We have upstairs more. <laughs> His archives contain millions of images of the biggest stars of the last 40 years. Ron Galella, a true legend of the photography of the 60s and 70s, has spent a lifetime tracking them down with his lens. This is the camera I shot Jackie with. And this is my jacket I designed, see? Paparazzo, extraordinaire, here I am. <laughs> We are all interested in glamour uh, of the superstars and it's curiosity that drove me to, to photograph them because we want to see these celebrities, how beautiful are they in real life, you know, because we see them as superstars uh, on the screen and TV. So it's curiosity to see them in person and photograph them. Paparazzi photography stems mainly from fascination. Fascination with Hollywood idols, with rock stars and with living legends. Of all the legendary figures that Galella caught on camera, one woman became a lifelong obsession, Jackie Kennedy. Galella's best known photograph is a shot of her crossing Madison Avenue in New York City an iconic image which made Galella famous and is now exhibited in museums around the world. It's known as Windblown Jackie. The way I got that picture was there was a, a model, Joy Smith, who needed portfolio pictures and she's going to pay me for them. And she lived near Jackie, 88th Street. So I picked her up and I took her to the park. And all of a sudden we see Jackie come out the side door and she didn't see us, and she walked to Madison Avenue, and we followed. And when I got to the corner, I made a good decision. Rather than run after her, I hopped a cab and took catch up to her two blocks at 90th Street. And I rolled down the window in the back, and I shot Jackie. Two shots, she didn't see me. It was a lot of noise. It was near 5 o'clock. And then luck was with me. The driver of the taxi was interested in Jackie and he blew his horn. And then she turned and that's how I got that picture of windblown Jackie. Jackie Kennedy and Ron Galella the star and the paparazzo, a pairing that's emblematic of showbiz culture. In what's almost a mythological battle between the superstar in the spotlight and the photographer, hovering like a thief in the shadows, ready to strike. The paparazzo is the ugly duckling of the photography world, an outcast, almost a hate figure. And yet some paparazzi images now hang on the walls of illustrious museums. These photographs have also fascinated and influenced numerous artists, especially in the pop art movement. And they've been appropriated by fashion designers and the contemporary art world. So beyond the tabloid headlines, is there such a thing as paparazzi art?
To understand the paparazzi phenomenon, we must return to its roots, which were not in journalism, but in the cinema. The term paparazzo appears at the end of the 1950s. It was invented by Fellini during the making of his film La Dolce Vita. It's a word that seems to echo the job itself. The word paparazzo has something playful about it. It suggests playfulness, and that is something that's in keeping with the paparazzi. It's a word which has a kind of buzz to it, like the paparazzi who buzz around. Released in 1960, La Dolce Vita is one of the most celebrated works by master filmmaker Federico Fellini and stars Marcello Mastroianni and Anita Ekberg. Set in 1950s Rome, the film centers on the jet set and the hordes of photographers who are already on their heels. One of them has a name which went on to become part of our everyday language. We were lucky enough to be given our name by Federico Fellini, and we should accept it. And Federico Fellini in La Dolce Vita calls the photographer, if you watch the film, he calls him paparazzo. And paparazzo is a combination of the word papatacci, which are those very annoying and very persistent little mosquitoes, and the word razzi, which is the flare of the photographer's flash gun. So there's this photographer, there's Marcello playing the journalist, and there's a photographer who follows Anita Ekberg around everywhere, down the Via Veneto to the Trevi Fountain. And Fellini calls him, the name of the character is Paparazzo. So the legend of the paparazzi was born with La Dolce Vita. But in fact, the phenomenon began much earlier. With the introduction of the first lightweight 35 mm cameras in the early 20th century, photographers began to come out of their studios and to work in the streets. At the same time, the illustrated press developed and photographic printing techniques improved. Everything was in place for the first candid shots of famous personalities to make their appearance. It's difficult to say whether there was a first paparazzo, because it's a phenomenon which starts to develop with the beginnings of the illustrated press between 1910 and 1920. But the first one to make it into the history books of the profession is Erich Salomon, a German reporter who was one of the first to use handheld cameras to take pictures of current events. There's a famous image which marks perhaps the start of the technique, which is a meeting at the Quai d'Orsay in 1930-31, during which the French foreign minister says, talking of the photographer, the king of the indiscreet is not here today. And all of a sudden, he sees a door opening and he points. And at that instant, of course, the photographer's finger presses the shutter. That image is inscribed in history as one of the very first photographs taken in the style of the paparazzi, even though it's not called that at the time. This year, the main targets of the paparazzi are Liz Taylor and Richard Burton during the filming of Cleopatra. It's not quite clear whether this is press intrusion or publicity. Making a splash in the magazines, this true life story in pictures has been sold around the world. In the 1960s, as the cult of celebrity takes shape, the figure of the paparazzo becomes a crucial player in the world of the media. Michel Giniès, a former paparazzi and collector, was starting in the profession at just that time, which he now sees as its golden age. As a film lover and a fan of people in the cinema world, I wanted to capture their image with my camera. In the 1970s in Paris, nothing could have been easier. You phoned the big hotels and they told you who was staying, whether it was Warren Beatty, Orson Welles. So I would head off to the hotel on my little motorbike. 
I felt as if I was reliving what I'd loved about La Dolce Vita as a youngster, a teenager. I felt like I was an actor in a film, except nobody was filming. But when you're face to face with Marlon Brando or with Paul Newman, who's leaving his hotel and going for dinner in a restaurant, when he gets the wrong place and ends up in a shady hotel, a place where there's Turkish guys playing pinball, I mean, you can take brilliant photos. So whilst they were in Paris for a few days, I would capture little bits of their lives. Capturing pieces of people's lives, stealing them against the celebrities' will. That's been the raison d'etre of the paparazzi from their beginnings to the present day. The common denominator of all of these photographers. The reason they entered the profession. Above all, it's the basis of what we can call the paparazzi aesthetic. A good photo is a stolen photo. When you look at the pictures of Cartier-Bresson, Douaneau, Brassai, all of those great photographers, with whom I'm certainly not comparing myself, I think they're good photos. Pose photographs are good when you want to do portraits and things like that. But when you really want a natural photograph, a fly-on-the-wall image with no constraints, no makeup, nobody in the background telling you and so on, it's like you're capturing the wild side of the people you're photographing. Pascal Rostin and Bruno Moron, the two big names of French paparazzidom. A rarity in this solitary profession, they've always worked as a pair and for many years were star photographers at Paris Match. That was brilliant. Much better. Yeah, because we chose just the café's terrace. And look at this one. Their stolen photographs have been taken mainly for the print media, rather than for any aesthetic purpose. But there are some gems tucked away in their archives. There are 300 boxes, 40 years' worth of archives. Uh, there's a thousand photos in each box, because a contact sheet contains 36. The hectares are the same. Plus, what's in the computer? There must be two or three hundred thousand photos. How many strong images will remain? If there were 10, that would be pretty good. Uh, 10, 20, I don't know. There are photos which to us seem very good, but you have to wait and see how they stand up to the passage of time, whether they pass the test or not. Ron Galella's picture of Jackie Kennedy is the best photograph of Jacqueline Kennedy. It's the best one. So yes, it's a photo he took on the fly, but it stood the test of time. It has become iconic. But when he took the photo, he didn't think about that. He never imagined that would happen. The good photographs, the ones that will last, are not always the ones you'd imagine. A photograph taken on the fly will sometimes be better than the one that's staged, even by a genius. Pascal and Bruno had first-hand experience of this when Orson Welles came to Paris in the early 1980s. In February 1982, he was invited by the Académie des Césars, the French equivalent of the Oscars, to be honorary president and to preside over the ceremony. For us, of course, Orson Welles in Paris is just a... When you're a photographer or a cameraman, it's just great news. So we wanted to meet him and to photograph him, whatever it took. So we went over and we were following him on Bruno's Harley Davidson. He had a lovely Bentley with a chauffeur and the images were so great, that was enough for us. Except that before he went into his hotel, we gave him our Paris match card and said, call us, we'd love to do some official photographs with you. He replied, no, I'm tired, I'm already doing a photo with Magnum. However, the next day, the two paparazzi received a phone call. Orson Welles wanted them to take a staged photograph of him in his hotel room. He organized the photo. He staged it, to the extent that he was actually directing us. When Orson Welles is directing you and he says, use a 24mm lens, he looks at the light and says, set it to 2.8. What kind of film are you using? Well, you keep your mouth shut. Paradoxically, although those pictures are nice, 30 years later when we did the famous exhibition and the book, we chose the photographs which weren't staged. In other words, the pictures we took before we had his agreement, because they're much more revealing than the photos that are posed and staged. The picture of him in the car was a piece of luck. You've got everything, the photographer, the journalist taking notes beside him, it's a perfect shot. You mustn't forget that there's also an element of luck. 
Photos don't just happen like that. You can't stage a photo like that. So there's luck. It's a piece of luck that, boom, the person in front of you that you're photographing is in exactly the right position and, boom, the lighting is exactly right. That's it. It's a kind of alchemy, which means that loads of ingredients are there and afterwards you think, that's not a bad photo, but you know perfectly well that it's not 100% down to you. You didn't set it up. There are circumstances which mean that the person you're photographing, the light, the expression, the right lens at the right time, and there you have it. A good paparazzo is one who can deal with all the different constraints. One of the most difficult things is really to choose the right moment to capture what Henri Cartier-Bresson called the decisive moment. And often when you look at paparazzi archives, you see hundreds, sometimes thousands of images. And there's only one photograph that brings together all of the necessary characteristics. The composition is good, the people are in exactly the right place. And in addition, the image says something. It tells a story. So if there is such a thing as paparazzi aesthetic, it's largely the result of chance. However, this method of capturing celebrities unawares, the voyeuristic and forbidden qualities of the photographs, quickly attracted the attention of other photographers, and especially major fashion photographers who in the early 1960s started to adopt this kind of photography themselves. One of the first names that comes to mind is Richard Avdon, who, for a feature in Harper's Bazaar in 1962, set up a kind of fake paparazzi shoot at Maxim's. So he created this photo shoot, which was rather ambiguous, because it seems that many readers at the time didn't realize that it was entirely staged and constructed, and took it absolutely at face value. Avdon, who was a highly intelligent photographer, understood perfectly well that this paparazzi style of photography implied a certain aesthetic, an extremely contemporary kind of aesthetic, which he could put to good use in his own fashion photography. Other big-name photographers were soon to follow in Avdon's footsteps. William Klein was particularly fond of taking series of paparazzi-style shots. These diversions did little to restore the image of the real paparazzi, however, who remained controversial and unloved. Aurore Fassard is a researcher who's worked on the portrayal of paparazzi in cinema, and how the outlines of a contemporary myth came to be drawn on the silver screen. The character of the picture snatcher, at first, before the term paparazzi was coined, is in any case a bad photographer, in the sense that he is kind of in opposition to the idealized image of the war photographer, to put it simply. So we have the war photographer as the hero, and the paparazzo, who's seen as an anti-hero. The picture snatcher represents negative values. He represents voyeurism and commercialism. He represents the trivial values of our society, which are widely maligned. The character in the film Picture Snatcher is a reformed gangster who, when he gets out of jail, he wants to go straight, so he becomes a picture snatcher. But in fact, it's a metaphor. His camera becomes his weapon. Voyeurs and criminals. Each in their own way, the paparazzi have always had to face this unsavory reputation, whether it's justified or not. People used to say to me, it's not a proper job. You take photographs of actors, you take photos in the street, you run after stars, you're a paparazzo. I took it as a kind of, not as a criticism, but it was a way of devaluing the work I did. But it didn't bother me that much because I knew what I was doing. I knew I was getting lots of pictures of people, and I said to myself, one day it's bound to be of interest. The paparazzi have a bad reputation nowadays. The word has become completely debased over the last 10 years, but it wasn't back then. 
What did I like about it? I liked it because it was a game. We were like big kids who'd forgotten to grow up. Let's face it, it was a game. And when your workplace is all the most magical places on the planet, it's pretty amazing. And our lifestyle, because we lived like them. They went to sunbathe in Mauritius, in the Caribbean or in Hawaii, and we were right there beside them. So there was that, and there was also the journalistic side, the investigative part. If you're a journalist who specializes in something, in medicine, in anything, uh, even in cooking, or if you're in local news stories, you want to be first with the story. Rightly or wrongly, the journalistic argument is also used by Sebastian Valiela, one of the busiest of the paparazzi working today. He has hundreds of cover photos under his belt in France and in Los Angeles. It was he who snapped French President Francois Hollande visiting the actress Julie Gaillet. He also revealed the existence of Francois Mitterrand's secret daughter, Mazarin Pinjot. I don't really have any qualms about it. We're here to entertain people more than anything. If it's a showbiz star, when it's a politician, our job is to inform people. Sometimes it can be important because if a president has a mistress or a child hidden away somewhere, well, that can tell us something about him. It can also raise problems with regard to security, things he might do in order to hide the things he shouldn't be hiding in the first place, and so on. It might cost the taxpayer money, or it might reveal a part of the person's personality which we should know about. There you are. I think our job is absolutely to inform people. From the 1960s to the present day, more than 50 years of shocking images, revelations and scandals. And always at the eye of the storm are the paparazzi, held responsible for the excesses of the tabloid newspapers. With the tragic death of Princess Diana in 1997, the profession's image was irreparably damaged. For the first time, paparazzi were accused of manslaughter, charges which were later dropped. Do these controversies prevent us from looking at paparazzi images from another angle, from analysing the rules of the genre and its possible photographic merits? If we look closer, paparazzi photography turns out to be extremely rich with a whole range of styles. But there's more than one way of snatching a picture. That's what's difficult when you look at this kind of photography. There isn't just one type of paparazzo. There isn't one paparazzi aesthetic. There are several. In particular, there's quite a strong difference, although some paparazzi do alternate between the two. But I'd say the main differentiation within paparazzi photography is whether you use flash photography or the telephoto lens. A flash gun in the dark will light up, it turns a street into a cathedral, there are projected shadows, and the people in front of you, they can't escape the flash. I think flash photography gives a great aesthetic to nighttime photography because often the background is a uniform black and only the person is lit up. This one is obviously for extreme cases because it's quite large. So that's really for sniper shots when you're really far away. Snipers can also take beautiful shots with their telephoto lenses, such as this shot taken undercover of the fabulously rich L'Oreal heiress Lilian Betancourt. It was funny because it was in the middle of the Betancourt legal case, and she happened to be at her residence in Parma, in Spain. I was in the mountains, a little bit higher up, and there was really a gap between the trees through which I could see one square metre of the swimming pool. I could hear her dogs running up and down beside the pool, barking and so on. I could hear the water slapping against the side, so I knew she was in there. And I just had to wait for the moment when she would appear in the gap between the trees, which was quite small. And she came along with her pool noodle, which made this photo quite fun. Aesthetically, I prefer the paparazzi photographs of 30 years ago because there's the black and white thing, the film negative, the grain, and there's the whole thing of being in close quarters with the subjects, which we no longer have at all. The aesthetics are completely different. Now we're working from far away, we're using digital, but we're in colour. The images are more flattened through the telephoto lens. Often there's no depth of field. 
They're focused on the people you're photographing. There's no atmosphere around them because you're not using a wide-angle lens. The images are often tightly framed and so on. So the two aesthetics are completely different and I really like the old ones. Flash versus telephoto lens, two aesthetics belonging to two schools of paparazzi. Two different attitudes to the star from the photographer on their trail. It's true that there are some paparazzi who are more like hunters. They're hidden, lying in wait, at a distance, and so they use the telephoto lens. And then there are others who go into battle, you might say, with their wide-angle lens, and who will go up as close as possible and try almost to enter into contact, into a confrontation with the celebrity, and snatch an image really close up. And that's more like a matador who's going right up and sticking a goad into the celebrity. The way I approach them, I usually have two cameras. One black and white with a wide angle, 35 millimeter. The other, uh, 85 millimeter. And I shoot fast, very fast. And I have the strobes that could shoot. I don't look through the, the viewfinder with the wide angle. I shoot looking at them. And even when they look at me, it's person to person. And that way you get genuine expression. See, a camera is a machine. And they look in the machine, that's not the same, you see. You want person to person, eye to eye. Hunted from afar or from close up, the prey remains the same. The celebrity, unique and at the same time interchangeable on the front pages of the newspapers. Tracked down by any means possible, by microlight, helicopter, motorboat, or with drones hovering in the skies above LA. And of course by car, a vehicle particularly popular with paparazzi as a place to lie in wait, a way to give chase and also because it's an excellent way of keeping a celebrity trapped. The car is one of the most recurring themes in paparazzi photography. In the street, you can run away, you can escape, turn away, you can get away. When you're in a car, it's over. You're caught. You have to accept it. I once was lucky enough to get a photograph of John Travolta, which I find really quite beautiful. He'd been to a party and he'd had quite a lot to drink. He was quite merry when he came out from this party one rainy evening in September 1978. He got into his car and before the car set off, I took a photo with a flash and the image is just Travolta's face with a shower of raindrops all over the car's window. If you analyse this category of the star in the car, or getting out of the car, there is within that an amazing number of different types of photograph. Whether it's uh, misty windows, the reflection of the flash, kind of collage effects, or actual superimposition of images. So with just that theme of the car, you find a very large number of ways and means of taking a photograph. Trapped in cars, but free to elude the photographer in the street. And celebrities will use whatever means they can. The paparazzi photo has generated a whole panoply of defensive gestures, starting with the famous hand in front of the face, which is a bid to obstruct the photographer's lens. Gainsbourg loved that, putting his hands out like that. But for Gainsbourg, when he put his hand out like that, it meant the opposite. It meant, come and take some photos. That's what it was for him. It was a game, because he had to do that. Hey, guys, no photos. The celebrity and the paparazzi, a game of cat and mouse. Sometimes it's good-humoured, but it can turn violent. And the anger is real, such as on this occasion, when Marlon Brando landed a punch on Ron Galella. Bring it home to me. Bring it home. Every paparazzo has a story to tell about a celebrity who resists. Mick Jagger. There was a soiree at the Pavilion d'Armanoville. 
Everyone who's anyone in Paris was there, and we had a pass to get in, so we were photographing him. And he was with Jerry Hall, and they were separated, and then they got back together again. So we were photographing them. And after a while, he'd really had enough, so we stopped. And then at one point, I saw him going upstairs. So I discreetly went upstairs too. And he and Jerry Hall were dancing rock and roll together. So I came along with my flash gun, a series of flash photos, paparazzi, dolce vita, via venito, a whole load of flash photography. It's a fabulous image. They're dancing rock and roll. And the reaction is a rock star's reaction. What does he do? He gets behind the trestle table, where there's about 50 cups laid out, and he starts lobbing them at me. The cups start flying through the air. Jerry Hall starts handing him the ammunition, and I left when he threw the ice bucket at me. I thought, next he'll throw the chair, the table. It's going to get out of hand. It was very abrupt and very fast. Catherine Deneuve, I liked her a lot, and I always tried to go easy on her. One day I was following her and she got to Avenue Montaigne and I started taking photos and to my amazement she suddenly turned on me like a fury and started calling me every name under the sun saying, you Mr. Butterwood and Melt, you're pissing me off. Do you know what I'm going to do? And she went up to my motorbike and tried to get my bag off it. I'd made her angry. So I accepted it. I said to myself, too bad, I'll accept it. I'll let Catherine Deneuve take her anger out on me. And she was three meters away, then two meters away, then a meter, and she ended up really very close to me. A few days ago, Brigitte Bardot went to England to make a film. Surrounded by crowds and by photographers, she was forced to give up, and the production relocated back to France. Of all the celebrities pursued by the paparazzi, women have often been the most vulnerable. The first to complain about it was Brigitte Bardot in the 1960s. Do you feel they spy on you in your private life? Yes, terribly. Spying, is that the word? Spying isn't a strong enough word. Hunted, then? That's more like it. I always have the feeling there are people with cameras. Always? Always. From Brigitte Bardot to Paris Hilton, each the epitome of womanhood for her own era and each relentlessly targeted by the paparazzi, an exclusively male profession. The personalities which attract the paparazzi are mainly women and women who express a certain kind of personality, which is particularly in tune with their era. So there is something which establishes itself between the hunters, who are mainly men, and the prey, who are mainly women. And I think that what's being played out is, in a sense, a gender exercise, a sexual exercise. There's something happening there which is to do with the battle of the sexes, the sex war, and which says a lot about the violence in our society towards women. American photographer Jessica Dimmock observed the sexual dimension of the phenomenon at close quarters when she worked alongside the paparazzi in Los Angeles. In order to photograph them, she spent long months with these men, often immigrants from Latin America, attracted by the greenbacks of the Hollywood star system. The work that the paparazzi do, the celebrities that they run after, are not all female, but it's a very gender dynamic. Even if it's a man, even let's say they're running after Brad Pitt, it's like, it's about his image and his beauty. It's this dynamic that's still very male to female. And they chase after these women and they chase after these idols all of the time. And often they don't get in. And they're like always frustrated and they're always on this, on this chase. And then I came along and I was this female photographer and I feel like it was their opportunity to be like, on your knees and beg. <laughs> Basically, you know, it was like really payback time in a weird way. Um, and they just weren't gonna make it easy. A 
lot of the guys are not American, so they're not necessarily native English speakers, but the language that's used around the kind of like vocabulary that's used in the paparazzi culture has so much sex in it that's it's unbelievable. And I don't even think that they always realize, but when they all show up and descend on a, a subject or a, a female celebrity, they call it a gangbang. And, uh, you know, and you hear these guys like speaking in Portuguese or speaking in Spanish and blah, 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 blah gangbang. You know, if a celebrity will pose for a picture, they call it giving it up, which is something that like a fraternity boy in the States would say about a woman that was sexually easy. There's a lot of these types of, ex of examples where the vocabulary is just filled with all of this like sex, which I enjoyed. <laughs> Symbolic violence, the body language of the victim. Recurrent themes such as the car, the violation of privacy. The paparazzi photograph has created certain conventions, immediately recognizable trademarks. Millions of shots in more or less similar styles, which are like the mirrors of our own voyeurism. All of this could not escape the attention of the art world. Beginning with pop art, a number of artists adopted the conventions of the paparazzi photograph for their own purposes, their own work, to talk about celebrity, to talk about the star system, the entertainment world, and in some cases, to talk about their own desire to be famous. Artists who drew upon the paparazzi aesthetic include Richard Hamilton, one of the founders of pop art, such as in this painting inspired by a photograph taken of Mick Jagger just after he'd been arrested for possession of drugs. There is, of course, the key figure of Andy Warhol, to whom we owe the quote, a good picture is one that's in focus and of a famous person doing something unfamous. Happy birthday. Warhol himself began taking society photographs at the end of the 1970s. Another example is the artist Cindy Sherman, in her series, Untitled Film Stills, she herself portrays the stereotyped women's roles familiar from the media. The many scenes she created during that period include images evoking the film star pursued by photographers. Bring it home. But it's today, in a world completely saturated with paparazzi images, that the number of artworks inspired by the phenomenon is greater than ever and ever more significant. London, home of the tabloid press and of the celebrity royal. It's here that in recent years, one photographic artist in particular has hit the headlines with images of the royal family or other celebrities in unusually intimate poses. William practicing feeding his baby the Queen changing a nappy and showing William Kate how to do it. Look, a little sweet baby. I cast five Prince Georges, all bald. The Queen on the loo, she's um, now 82. She's phenomenal. But she was not happy about doing this photograph at all. As you'll have guessed, the people in the photographs are lookalikes, and the photographer's name is Alison Jackson. This English artist plays with our imaginations as readers and creates images that the paparazzi can only dream of. Imaginary exclusives, sometimes anachronistic like this one of Diana and Marilyn Monroe going shopping together. Photographs which are unsettling to say the least. My work really is about how the media has constructed the whole celebrity industry. So it's not just about celebrities, it's about how we see celebrities everywhere. And the only way we see celebrities everywhere is through magazines, press, TV, now the internet, now everyone's got infected.
you know, I'm an artist, but there's a slight bit of journalist in me too. You know, I'm like an investigative journalist. I want to, you know, find out. I read a lot. I read a lot of biographies. I want to know about the celebrity. I start imagining what they might like be a, a, like at home. I talk to uh, psychologists to work out what that uh, celebrity might really be like. A journalist of the imagination, Alison Jackson is above all highly provocative. Perhaps this is why she is so fascinated by the tabloid press and the paparazzi. The paparazzis are very, very good photographers. The paparazzis have to work very fast, they have to be very quick with the camera, they have to be very technically good, so that when they pick up the camera everything's got to be sharp and in focus or whatever, but you can always tell it's a slightly snatched photograph. So there is this kind of snatch look. I try and replicate that with my uh, photography. So I try and make it look snatched uh, or caught, but in fact it is, you know, very carefully constructed. With her fake photo opportunities, like this one with David and Victoria Beckham lookalikes in Japan, Alison Jackson feeds into the ambiguity inherent in her work so that sometimes her photo shoots draw crowds of fans in the streets. <laughs> Some of her photographs, although quite obviously staged, have sparked real outrage, especially the ones showing Princess Diana and her newborn baby with Dodi Al Fayed, photographs created after Diana's death. So I was making a comment about the media, how the media had constructed Princess Diana into this big icon, as if we knew her intimately, but we didn't really know her. And they were then taking my work, putting it back into the press and saying how disgusting I was and how tasteless I was to make these kind of comments. Once or twice, I have come across a couple of huffy celebrities who really don't like my work. I may have just made a photograph or a film or something which is just over the limit for them, which I'm very sorry about because it's not really about the, the real celebrity for me. It's about us and how we uh, perceive celebrity and our perception of celebrity through the media. Artists playing at being paparazzi but there are also paparazzi who turn themselves into artists. That's the case with French duo Rostin and Moron. In an exhibition at the Centre Pompidou Metz, devoted to the paparazzi phenomenon, they are present both as press photographers and as artists with their project called Trash. What we do is this normally. This is Madonna's trash, which we brought back from Los Angeles. Here's a letter which she received for her daughter, Lord Chichon Lian, with the address. That's what you call authenticating the provenance of the trash. Because that happened to us with Brad Pitt. We knew it was his trash but we didn't have any piece of paper, any subscriptions or letters with his name on them. So we didn't take it. It's their identity. So you can't make a mistake. Didn't we put in the hemorrhoids? No, we're not allowed to. The bottle of Coke, put it on the left. No, no at the top. For the past 10 years, Rostal and Mouron have been collecting the contents of celebrities' rubbish bins in Paris and Los Angeles and photographing them as though they were still lifes. They've swapped their telephoto lens for an old-fashioned camera obscura. This is what the first cameras were like, what they called camera obscura. They were first made in the early 20th century and they carried on making them. This one must be, uh, it's quite recent, it's only about 20 years old. But it's true that they don't make them anymore, because this uses film, and nowadays it's all digital. We tried all sorts of equipment, analog, camera obscura, digital, and for the moment, we're getting the best quality from this piece of equipment, which is certainly a bit old, 
but which is extraordinary in terms of results, in terms of quality, because the photos are set to be hung on the walls of museums, art galleries. So if you want to produce really big formats that are life-size, in fact, what's brilliant is that you can print pictures that are 150 by 180, which are the dimensions of what we're photographing. And when they're hung, we've seen people trying to take hold of the objects in the photo because it's life-size. A final little adjustment. The paparazzi are often accused metaphorically of rifling through people's rubbish. So by literally rummaging in dustbins to create works of art, Rostin and Moran would seem to be thumbing their nose at their old profession. But in fact, the inspiration for this project was completely different. Trash was born after the pair read an article by a sociology professor about current trends in consumerism. He'd asked his students to collect the trash from the dustbins of 10 French families over the space of a year. And in his essay, he explained something interesting. He said, you really see people's personalities through what they consume, because you see what they eat, what they drink, whether they smoke, what they read, if they've got children, pets. At the time, I was doing all the photos of Gainsbourg for Paris Match. And one day, we went back to Serge's place in the Rue de Verneuil after lunch, and we bumped into Fulbert. Fulbert was his butler. At least he called him Fulbert, but I think his name was René or Marcel. And Fulbert was taking out the bins. So two brain cells connected, and I said to Serge, he's the only one who knew that we'd taken his rubbish. I said, I'm taking your bins. He went, uh, and I said, don't worry. So Bruno and I got back to the studio, and we laid it all out like that, very much like a taxidermist. And it was such a caricature of Serge, the gitan packets, the bottles of Ricard. It was so incredible, we weren't too sure whether we should carry on. We thought people would say we'd made it up. So now we don't move. Has he put it back? Yes, yes. It's true that working in this way as artists brings us perhaps a bit more than if we continue to work as paparazzi these days. Because the profession has changed, the people we used to photograph have changed, everything has changed. So for us it's a new direction, we're trying to go in a new direction. What's exciting about Rostin and Meuron at the end of the day is that through their own photographic practice, they have evolved alongside the recognition of the paparazzi aesthetic, starting out as paparazzi and now working as real artists. We can say that they are present at each stage of the exhibition and at every stage of the legitimization of paparazzi photography by the museums. Long despised, the paparazzi aesthetic seems at last to have been recognized and to have found its place in the history of photography. Will our opinion of these photographers change as a result? Will we take a more detached view of their pictures? Haven't we, in spite of ourselves, already integrated all of the paparazzi's photographic conventions? Have they become embedded in our subconscious without our noticing? It occupies an extremely important position in our society because celebrity is everywhere and it has a place in the media landscape and in the visual landscape quite simply because it's everywhere. Celebrity is absolutely everywhere, so the paparazzi is also everywhere, at least in a latent sense because the paparazzi make this celebrity visible. It's entered into daily life, but it's true that the history of photography shows us that this is often the case. Marginal forms become part of the mainstream canon. It's true that today we are no longer shocked when we see a blurred image or a very cropped composition with red eyes or images which are not necessarily of a very high quality. And all those elements could fall within the paparazzi aesthetic. Saturated with these images, armed with our telephones, have we become mini paparazzi too, pursuing ourselves and the world around us? Nowadays, with smartphones and digital cameras, everyone is in a good position to take a picture. But I don't think that means the death of the paparazzi photograph. I think that the shots which are very complex and which take weeks of preparation and require quite complex technical equipment, I think there will be more of those to come in the years ahead. I can't imagine someone with a smartphone, for example, photographing some of the scoops that I get, because that would mean them getting up close to the person and doing that. Because with a smartphone, you can't hide. You can't be more than a couple of meters away. So we'd have to do that and get a good shot.
C'est un virus, on n'arrêtera jamais. It's like a virus, we'll never stop. And I think that when I retire and I'm back home in Brittany in the Raz de Saint, fishing for sea bass, if I see a yacht go by with Barack Obama's daughter and the grandson of Princess Caroline of Monaco, I'll follow them to the ends of the earth, because it's a virus. I don't at all deny that I was what I was, a paparazzo. I don't deny that. The only thing I say is, hang on, you have to remember the context and the era. If I was asked to do it all again now, I wouldn't be a paparazzo. It no longer interests me. There's a line which I like very much from the surrealist poet Paul Éluard, who was himself a great collector of images from popular culture. Paul Éluard collected postcards. And he said of these postcards that they were not art at best, they are the small change of art. But they sometimes conveyed the idea of gold. And I think that when we look at these paparazzi photographs, when we examine, as we did for this exhibition, tens of thousands of images, we get the feeling that it's not art. At best, it's the small change of art. But it sometimes conveys the idea of gold.